Hi, my name is Dr. Andrew Carr from the Strategic and Defence Studies Centre. I'm here with my colleague, Dr. John Lee, an adjunct associate professor. John, you see China's rise as much more disputed than many people, especially on the kind of economic grounds. Why are you more cautious? Well, China has been rising for 30, 35 years, so history tells you they've done a pretty good job. But think about what they have to do to continue to rise rapidly. They essentially have to go from being a middle-income country uh, to a high-income country. Now, you look at the world, only around 30 countries have done that, and you look at the way they've done that, the most important thing they've, or the one thing they've all had in common is institutions. So institutions like rule of law, property rights, intellectually, uh, intellectual property rights, um, a, an absence of corruption or relative absence of corruption. Now you look at the institutions in China, it will be very difficult for the Chinese to develop those without significant disruption. Uh, I'm not saying that they can't do it, but there are certainly strains on the authoritarian model. Uh, and I'm not quite sure that the Chinese Communist Party um, quite knows how to go from that middle income to the advanced economy stage. And what does this economic trouble mean for China's bid to become a dominant power in Asia? Well, obviously, um, economic strength underpins military uh, strength and other forms of power. And for China to be the dominant power in Asia, uh, without American withdrawal, that is, it essentially needs to go past that middle income to that advanced economy stage. The problem for China is that its military um, still remains significantly behind America's military capability. And as these economic and domestic problems come to the fore, and I'm talking about an ageing population, uh, rising inequality, lack of social safety nets, there'll be a greater contest for funds from the public purse. Right now, China spends about 15% of its uh, central budget on national security, that is external security and internal security. Um, budgets for national security have been rising about 50% faster than GDP growth. Now, that can't be sustained. So quite a few headwinds are coming. Uh, and I'm not just saying China won't be a formidable power, it already is, but for it to be the dominant power, um, it, it has to deal with these other uh, priorities, domestic priorities, and I think they'll be more urgent um, than, than the desire uh, to be the dominant power in Asia. In your lecture, you describe China as a lonely power. What role do other countries in the region have with China's potential rise? Well, it struck me that when you look at other rising economic powers in the world or in world history, they've all exerted some sort of strategic pull um, or at least a capacity to coerce other countries around them, smaller countries around them, into their strategic orbit. orbit. Now, you look at China's strategic situation, it doesn't have any genuine allies to speak of. You may want to include North Korea or Pakistan, but I'm sure the Chinese would rather not. Um, it doesn't even have any real genuine strategic partners to speak of. Russia and so on, I wouldn't really consider a strategic partner. So China is a very lonely power, and I've made the point that China could well be the loneliest rising power in world history. Now, if you look at the geography of Asia, um, it's, a, it, it's a very contested space. Uh, and, sh and it's just not conceivable, in my view, that China could become the dominant power in the region uh, without those strategic allies or partners. And if China is not going to become the dominant power in Asia, as many see as an almost inevitable path, what does this mean for Australia's strategic policy? Well, Australia's strategic policy, you know, basically for the last um, um, four or five decades, has been the American alliance and secondly, to facilitate the American presence in a region. I don't think that has to change. Now, how we do it may have to change. So, for example, the rise of China is significant. Australia doesn't have the capacity to significantly or alter the balance of power in Northeast Asia, uh, but we do have the capacity still to both uh, uh, affect the balance of power in Southeast Asia and also to facilitate the American presence uh, in a region, and thirdly, to, uh, in a sense, increase confidence that the American alliance system can, can hold. So I think Australia should overplay its hand, but it certainly has an important role um, to facilitate that continued American presence. Yes, there'll have to be some fitting in of China in, in the current system. Some things will change, but I don't see a fundamental strategic uh, reorientation uh, in China's favour, um, certainly in my lifetime. Thank you for your discussion. Thank you for having me. You can see Dr. Lee's lecture with Dr. 
of Emeritus Professor Paul Dibb on the Australian National University's website, along with a podcast. Thank you.